Welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Uh, my name is Jay. Uh, appreciate all the folks showing up today. While you're here, just, you know, I urge everybody to, you know, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, um, and so that we can keep bringing you content like this. Uh, support us on Patreon. Um, that information should be in the chat, but our Patreon is also patreon.com slash millennials are killing capitalism. Today, I'm super, super excited to bring you this conversation. Um, we are going to be talking with organizers, spokespeople from um, Palestine Action and Palestine Action US, which is the recently launched um, United States branch of Palestine Action. And um, I have a couple of great guests with you today for you today, Huda and Fergie. I'm going to go ahead and bring them up now so that we can get into this conversation. All right, uh, Huda and Fergie, welcome to Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Um, before we go any further, could you just briefly introduce yourselves to the audience? Yeah, I'll Huda, go ahead. Go ahead. Um, I'm Huda. I'm a Palestinian and Iraqi. I live in Britain, and I'm a co-founder of Palestine Action in Britain. Uh, I'm Fergie Chambers. I am an unfortunate blend of Northern European uh, in the settler colony known as the United States. Um, and I, I work with uh, a few groups, including um, the, the Babichki Funding Collective, uh, the Berkshire Communists, and now Pal Action US. Awesome. Well, welcome both of you to this show. Um, so before we get too far into this, could you just talk a little bit about, you know, for folks who are not familiar, what Palestine Action is, and also then what uh, Palestine Action US is. For folks who want more context, you know, we also did an audio podcast interview with you, Huda, last year, um, around, well, in I think December or November of last year, um, I think that's also in the show notes or in the description so folks can get, you know, deeper conversation on that. But give folks some idea of what Palestine Action is and um, maybe say a little bit also about Elbit Systems, which I know your big campaign is shutting Elbit down. Yeah, so Palestine Action is a direct action network. Uh, we set up, we launched in July 2020 in England. And it was mainly a response to realizing that every other traditional campaigning method when it came towards trying to end British complicity with the apartheid state of Israel was failing um, and, and wasn't, wasn't achieving much at all. If anything, the ties just kept increasing, the complicity kept increasing, and we decided that the only uh, viable route left was direct action. And so we started by um, basically our main target, uh, targeting our main um, target, which is Elbit Systems, which is Israel's largest weapons manufacturer. When we started Palestine Action, they had 10 sites in the UK, lots of factories, about five factories, two headquarters. I mean, I don't know why they needed two, but, but there you go. They had two and they also work in three Royal Air Force sites, which is British military um bases in england and so we said that we're just going to go straight to the source shut them down repeatedly um and and try and build a bigger movement where we get more and more people taking that action to to hit them on a sustained basis in order to stop them from operating uh, stop them from profiting from the genocide of the palestinian people and ultimately to shut them down um, so that's that's kind of a brief overview of what Palestine Action is. We are a direct action group. Uh, as I mentioned, Elbert Systems, um, I'm sure Fergie can talk more about this, but they are the majority provider of weapons for the Israeli military. And basically all of the weaponry they make has been marketed as tested on the Palestinian people. And that's because when they attack Gaza, as they do frequently, and in the West Bank as well, they often try and test out new products, <clears throat> whether that's drones that are flying above them, surveilling them constantly, and used to drop bombs on them as well, or whether that's uh, new missiles. We've just seen they're using these iron, um, I think it's called Sting missiles, which they've just started developing on Palestinians now in Gaza. 
Um, and so they also produce 85% of their drone fleet, their land-based equipment, the bullets you see being used to massacre Palestinians, parts for tanks that you see being used now, now bordering Gaza um, at the moment. And basically, whenever you see Elba rep um, Israeli weaponry being used, either the whole weapon or part of that weapon will be produced by Elbert Systems. And because they can develop weaponry on the Palestinian people, they can globalize their weapons trades and basically globalize the industry that they're building off the back of the occupation of Palestine. And that's why you see them producing parts of these weapons that are used to massacre Palestinians, but also selling weapons after they've been used in Palestine to other imperial governments. Um, and I'm sure Fergie can, can expand on that from a US perspective. Yeah, totally. Um, I mean, uh, most of the most of the important numbers I think Hada just shared, uh, just you know, the fact that this is a company that's actually providing most of the weapons, you know, eighty-five percent of the drone fleet. Um, but I would I would especially just echo um, uh, how Israeli weapons, Israeli track, Israeli tactical training, uh, really is like a like a launching point. For global imperialism and global violence, um, uh, even outside, you know, I remember when I was at the Standing Rock encampment, and maybe y'all remember that there were, uh, you know, Zionist tear gas cans uh, that were showing up at Standing Rock. Uh, for for that's just that, that occurred to me while we were talking. But um, you know, the reach of the reach of Elbit is is really broad, and it and it follows this pattern where, as 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 Huditz had just said before me, uh, tactics and weapons are tested on Palestinians. And then they're used elsewhere. Um, I've, I've had a lot of involvement with the, well, really with anti-police stuff in Georgia prior to Stop Cop City. But then because of the comrades I developed there, I've been involved with that too. Um, you know, and probably the biggest uh, law enforcement exchange uh, with the Zionist entity is in Georgia, um, out of Georgia State in Atlanta. Um, it, you know, and, and we've seen over the last 20 years, you know, and as even just as policing has developed in Atlanta and the tactics that they use in that city, even against protesters, um, it, it, you know, it's developed considerably. The technology has developed considerably and it's all kind of rooted in this relationship with uh, the surveillance and weapons industry uh, out, out of this, out of the occupation, um, you know, and so now we know that Elbit sort of begins on Palestinians and then branches out uh, uh we understand that that uh, Modi's India is is a big big buyer of Israeli weapons. Um, Azerbaijan, of course, you know everywhere you see this like axis of imperialism. Uh, you know, Elbit's uh, European sales went up forty percent uh, after the SMO began in February in Ukraine. Um, mm -hmm. You know, so everywhere that this sort of like NATO U.S. empire is pushing, uh, you know, you, you will find Elbit and you will find Israeli arms. Um, as for the U.S., I think, look, uh, we've been very inspired by the work that our comrades in the U.K. have done for years now. Um, you know, I, I have a background of a lot of direct action. I sort of like moonlight as a semi-journalist and a funder. But like, frankly, I'm an agitator, um, you know, at heart. Uh, and so I, there's been a, a really big desire to, 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 to bring these kinds of tactics into the conversation and basically to just bring serious resistance into the conversation. Um, cause I look, one thing that I think having been around Palestine stuff since I was a, a little boy, um, I was very lucky to be kind of, to grow up with, uh, some very strong anti-Zionist Jews, um, including a person I consider my mentor who was on your show like last week or two before we were little children together, uh, Max and I, um, and, uh, as a result of that, I've seen how like in 20 years, like the level of awareness and, and like public dialogue about Palestine, I mean, it's shifted dramatically. Um, I, I no longer think we're really at a point where our primary task is to win over public opinion, right? Mm -hmm. Public opinion of the people on earth is soundly with the Palestinians everywhere you look. Even in this country now, I think in ways maybe we didn't even expect with the, the size of these rallies. So what does this do? It underscores, I think, what, what those of us on the revolutionary left understand, which is that awareness is not everything. Uh, uh, it, it, it's about, you know, who controls the instruments of power. Um, so when when the ruling class remains the ruling class, we can turn out millions of people in marches, you know, and Joe Biden can cackle and blink and things go on as they do. Uh, right. So something has got to change. Um, and 
and just getting yourself performatively arrested uh, isn't going to be enough. I, I like that escalation. I like that any point of escalation from sort of simply marching and pleading, I think is good. But uh, the brilliance of, of Palestine Action UK, and, and we were also lucky to have uh, some comrades from the US that were involved with that, so we knew about it, um, was that it, it, it did laser focus so much on, on such a, a significant company, but also uh, was able to generate momentum by by targeting a, one single company instead of just kind of like, oh, we, we shut Raytheon down today. We shut Boeing down tomorrow. We shut General Dynamics down the next day. Like, yeah, nobody liked that. And it's a nice it's a nice bit of play acting, but you're not scaring these companies because there's there's no momentum. So I think uh, the when, when we actually saw that some of these locations in the UK were shutting down for good, uh, you know, and and that the people were really getting behind it, um, it felt like it felt like it was time for us to move on Elbit. Um, and uh, a lot of us in this initial core are either from or based in New England. Um, uh, there are 12 Elbit locations in the US. Um, the, the HQ is actually in Texas, um, but they do have a couple of operations or an operations center and an innovation center in, in New England. That's the one in Cambridge. Um, you know, and, and the, uh, we had folks who had done good work kind of mapping Elbit. Uh, and their presence in the country for a while. Uh, and, and when everything popped off in the last few weeks, it felt like sort of time to go. And that was that was so well received, um, especially mm -hmm. by the Palestinian diaspora community, who frankly were frustrated with the nature of the response that they were seeing. You know, because because we were seeing now we're up to what, what, what four or five thousand people killed in the last two weeks in Gaza. Uh, I believe it's five thousand as of this today. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and, it, you know, and. and almost 1500 children uh you know and it's like so so infantilizing these people uh seeing this exclusively through a lens of humanitarianism uh you know and like oh if we just sort of go around and cry about it everyone's going to feel better and the bombing continues uh yeah. this is the message we've been getting fucking do something about it so we so we launched <laughs> yeah right on um i think that you know, we don't need to go deep into this context, but one of the things that I remember, too, from our prior conversation, Huda, is that, like, you're somebody who has been through kind of the whole ladder of, like, mm -hmm. how you would protest or resist or whatever this you've worked through. I know trying to get legislation change, policy changes, um, you know, protesting, marching, etc. right, before you really landed as an organization on... Um, taking direct action. Maybe yeah. we could just a couple of points I think might be helpful for folks to get some like spatial awareness of this, like in terms of like where are some of these, um, you know, physical Elbit places so that they know because I think, you know, people might think, oh, this is far away from me or, you know, whatever. And then another thing that I think would be good is if you could just talk a little bit about some of, um, the examples of past direct actions that uh, I mean, we could talk about the one that occurred uh, last week, I think it was in the United States in Cambridge, but also, um, you know, ones that have occurred in the past couple of years in the UK, just to give an idea yeah. for folks of like what we're talking about. Yeah, definitely. So I'll just start with just touching on like that other stuff. And especially now with everything that's happening now in uh, Gaza, because you know, I, one of the things you see is this constant cycle. So you see Gaza being bombed. You see a lot of people paying attention. You see mass protests. I'm talking from an England perspective, but I'm pretty sure it's similar in the US. You see petitions being sent to the government and then you see nothing change, right? And, and I think I've seen this happen so many times that it's frustrating when there is so much potential through this type of action for people to just shut down completely the Israeli war machine globally. And it needs that war machine and these factories globally in order to be able to sustain what it is doing in Palestine. And I think when people feel powerless, um, and right now seeing what's happening in Palestine, that it's important to realize that actually you have an ability to shut down these factories. You have an ability to go out there and do something so direct and to really impact uh, the situation in Palestine and how they're able to profit from the genocide of the Palestinian people, that to me, it's crazy not to do it, right? Especially with what we're seeing 
um, at the moment. Like, if you're not going to do it now, when? When are we going to do it, right? And I think seeing Palatine Action US launch is um, is extremely exciting, especially in this moment in time, which can be, uh, you know, very daunting. And, 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 you know, I just had one of my friends lost um, 23 members of their family last night, um, including, you know, their, their Ahmed al Nauk. he lost his father, he lost his brothers and sisters, he lost his nieces and nephews. And uh, his mother already was killed because Israel wouldn't let them get treatment. Um, in 2020, and his other brother was killed by a drone strike in 2014, right? And I just think that when we see these things happening and how close it is to home, it's not, and it's not just about the immediacy, we have to end the occupation and the apartheid regime that is happening. And obviously, so much of that comes from Palestinians themselves in Palestine fighting on the front line. But as, as Israel globalizes its arms trade, globalizes its the, the industry of the occupation, our solidarity has got to be international and not just in the context of getting out in the streets, crying and shouting about it. We need to shut down these factories and really assist Palestinians in liberating themselves from this 75-year uh, regime that our governments have been uh, supporting for, for a very long time. Um, now, just talking about some of the actions that we do, there's a variation, I would say. Um, we have gone and stormed into offices, uh, spray painted inside, that kind of stuff. That was kind of like what we started off by doing. Um, that was our first few weeks. We just kept going back to the London headquarters, finding our way inside, uh, trying to get up to the seventh floor where Elbit was. Couldn't take the lift, had to run up seven flights of stairs. Um, but, you know, it was that kind of thing, trying to get in there. Like, we didn't have anything at the time, but we just said, right, we can we can walk in and grab some spray paint and do something. Um, and then pretty soon after, and this is what we, we see more and more now, um, we realize that you've got to get out to the factories where they're producing these products. And often they're not... Um, in the heart of London, even though that would be nice and convenient, it's you've got to get out to the sticks sometimes, right? And we would climb on top of these factories and dismantle them as much as possible because not only are you able by, um, this is just an another tactic, there are other tactics that have been used, but when you climb on the roof of these factories, it's harder for them to get you down. They don't, they don't open up basically when you're on the roof, especially if you have a sledgehammer in your hands, they don't want to open up because of health and safety and all that. And we cause as much damage as possible because it stops them from working even after you've been arrested, even after you've been taken down, that they have to do all of those repairs, et cetera. So it knocks them out in terms of being able to produce things and continue working there for uh, weeks at a time, we would see this happen. And so we've seen a lot of that in Palestine action over here. Um, but we also see like people blockading gates, you know, if they got one gate in and out, you blockade that gate, whether it's with a lock on or a vehicle or just sitting in front of it and making them drag you, uh, they can't get into work. So it's just, it's, it's putting your body in the way, putting, your, putting yourself in the way of these arms being made. Um, and that is something that we have done quite a lot. But there's also been actions where people like, get away, basically, and, and uh, don't occupy the site. And we've um, seen secondary targets, so targeting of landlords, targeting of suppliers, and really putting pressure on the whole supply chain um, of, of, of how these weapons factories work. Because it, when you, especially like when you knock out one Elbit site, a lot of these factories work in tandem with one another. So you disrupt their whole supply chain. So it can be incredibly impactful, but also they can't operate in isolation. They, you know, if they don't own the site themselves, a lot of the times they don't, they need landlords, they need people to give them loans, et cetera. So there's different ways of applying pressure in order to shut them down. But I think arguably the most effective way is going straight to the site and just shutting it down day after day, week after week, month after month. And I think that was those tactics that we saw um, shut down their factory in Oldham. That happened at the start of last year and ultimately their headquarters in London. Um, and also we saw at the end of last year, they were kicked out of contracts with hundreds of millions of pounds 
because we were making them an unsecure uh, weapons company to work with for the Ministry of Defense because we didn't realize this at the time, but every time someone would break inside the factory, which people have done, and smash up the weapons inside, they have to, or breach security in any way, they have to report this to the Ministry of Defense because they're highly classified and all of that stuff and they've got to be secure. Um, and so every time you manage to breach their security, it's every time their partners are like, you are not a secure company to work with. What about all of our secrets and all of that stuff that can get out? So they're extremely effective tactics. And I think there's just different ways we've realized over time of how they can really impact Elbit's business. Yeah, great. Fergie, do you want to add anything on the recent action in Cambridge? Uh, sure. I, I mean, uh, I think first off, I would just sort of reflect uh, what, what Huda said about, um, you know, it's not just that, that because I went through similar patterns of trying kind of different levels of action and organizing in different contexts. Um, and at the end of the day, uh, it, forget just Palestine, you know, many of these great turning points, at least in like revolutionary consciousness, sometimes in policy, uh, usually some kind of very intense direct action is what precipitates that. We think about a Wendy's in Atlanta um, after the killing of Richard Brooks. We think about a, a precinct in Minneapolis. We think about even just, you know, interactions with power brokers in cities, like within a city. You know, we, we interrupted an, an FIDF gala in Atlanta in 2016. Um, you know, and it got the, the, the head of Home Depot, like, calling my grandmother personally, you know, like, all worked up about stuff. Like, so you notice how actually these individuals who are pulling these levers, like, this shit freaks them out, uh, which is worth something. Um, so as for Cambridge, um, uh, yeah, there's actually been uh, a number of actions, smaller actions, uh, targeting Cambridge to this point. The kind of uh, kickoff for... <laughs> Um, was, I, I can't even remember the date now, but it was about a week and change ago. Um, and we locked down to the main entrance uh, and defaced the front of it considerably, put messaging about, you know, Elbit committing genocide and so forth. And it's a fairly busy corner in Cambridge. Um, you're about half a block off of the sort of primary intersection of Central Square, um, which is situated right between Harvard and MIT, uh, each way on Mass Ave, which, and this is also deliberate, right? Because we're thinking about uh, how basically the theoretically the greatest academic minds in our in our country are, are being rooted through those two institutions uh, on one hand into making weapons uh, out of MIT and on the other hand into deciding who gets to use them where out of Harvard, uh, you know, especially in the Kennedy School. Um, so I think uh, Cambridge became a good target for for a lot of reasons uh, that that was a piece of it. Um, there's also it's one of these situations in, in the Cambridge Center where they 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 don't own the building. Um, uh, they do have a landlord. The landlord uh, is is a real estate firm which includes uh, former Lieutenant Governor of Massachusetts O'Reilly, who is on the board of Boston College. Uh, seven of the board members are in senior executive or senior administrative positions of major national unions. Um, uh, and then there's a work bar, like a co-working shared space downstairs from Elbit, and an architectural firm who uh, flies a trans flag and a Black Lives Matter flag in the windows upstairs from Elbit. So uh, we were, are also very hopeful that uh, their co-tenants and their landlord might not be super happy uh, about what they're doing and about the reaction to what they're doing. So, you know, we began with that and then folks came back by, uh, you know, a few different nights and... and uh, really up the visuals. Uh, we got paint up to their windows on the higher floors. Um, uh, their key card scanners were disabled. Um, uh, so we, we, especially as, we, and I guess we'll talk about this in a bit, but as we launch, uh, we're doing like an intro Zoom launch tomorrow. Um, and, and what we hope to do is really up our capacity. Um, not so much that you know, everybody's going to know everybody everywhere. But if we have a lot of folks who are active in all of these places, and please let me know when I should speak about kind of where Elbit is everywhere in the U.S. Um, but, that, but that if we have sort of small crews who are ready to just go day after day after day, and it doesn't have to be like, you know, the same team of people coordinating and planning every single action. And we wait two weeks. But no, no, we, we, 
we, we want to send the message that, especially as we get this ball rolling, that we are going to disrupt business and we're going to disrupt business constantly and we're going to use any means that we need to uh, to get that point across and to have the material effect that we want, which is, as Hada said, to shut the, to shut the places down. Um, yeah. Right on. Yeah. Sorry. Hang on. I'm trying to put in the chat. So disregard the last, the first two messages there because I had a typo in them, but... Um, the the link to this webinar, I believe, is also in the show description. Um, you can definitely go to Pal Action US on um, what I still call Twitter, but X. Um, now and, you can. Um, yeah, yeah, and uh, yeah. Now you can. Right. Um, it was one of the craziest sort of banning. Like for folks who don't know, the account was up, but nobody could follow it for like 10 days or something like that. And uh, now folks can follow it. So that's good. Um, but uh, there is this Zoom webinar that is tomorrow um, that folks should absolutely check out to, to learn even more. Um, so we did put a link to that in the chat just now. And um, yeah, so anyways, definitely want folks to talk about that. Um, Go ahead and say some of the you were going to say, Fergie, some of the places that the Elbit systems is in the United States. Um, yeah, go ahead. So, yeah, so there there are 12 locations um, that, that we know about right now. Of course, any sort of major international conglomerate is going to have subsidiaries and kind of shadow groups that take a little bit longer to map. Um, so I would guess that truly Elbit has a much larger presence than we know yet. Um, and we will know. Uh, but uh as i said the ushq is in fort worth texas um and then we have locations in boca boca raton florida um that's a laboratory um there's an operations center which is where they're really producing and shipping stuff in talladega alabama um uh we were very thankful that that's close to a lot of our atlanta comrades who we know are pretty ready to do stuff um uh ladson south carolina um, and then there are three locations in Virginia. Roanoke is over in the West more, um, and then Reston. And there's an office for the D.C. area in Arlington. Um, also, of course, a lot of very politically uh, motivated folks in the DMV area generally. Um, uh, Birdsboro, PA. I'm, I'm not even sure where Birdsboro is. Uh, up in my neck of the woods, we've got, of course, the Cambridge Innovation Center. And then we have the Merrimack, New Hampshire Operations Center. Uh, I live in New Hampshire, not far from Boston. Um, and that's a huge uh, distribution and production center. Uh, and, and there are a, a number of weapons firms sort of right there because, of course, New Hampshire is a tax haven. Um, uh, and But Boston, Cambridge are sort of tech and, and weapons centers. So a lot of them kind of outsource their factory 40 minutes up over the tax border in New Hampshire. Um, there's a, an operation center in San Antonio, Texas. And then uh, there's one more location in uh, De Leon Springs, Florida. Um, so really uh, it's kind of up and down the East Coast all over. Um, and I, I think another reason that uh, other than just kind of where those of us who got going were and those of us who knew folks at Pal Action UK were, uh, another reason that we also started with Cambridge is just kind of understanding the political landscape um, of the places we're working with. Uh, I, I think it will behoove our comrades who want to get mobilized uh, in, in the rural South. Uh, and, and I say this as someone who's done organizing and direct action in the rural South, uh, that it, it, it will behoove those comrades to understand the lay of the land uh, fairly well in those places, because I think we know that uh, they can come at you pretty hard. And, and again, I think that's, that's, worth, that's worth getting into. Uh, uh, it's a confrontation worth having. Um, but uh, we, uh, it, it'll probably, Take us a moment to to find the folks who are down there. Um, yeah, but right the, uh, we'll post that list repeatedly too, um, yep. and there's screenshots of it so that people are aware. Right on. Um, so a couple of things I do want to get to. Um, first of all, Birdsboro is about an hour and twenty minutes from Philadelphia. I just mapped it real quick. So, <laughs> um, but uh, nice answer. <laughs> um, but uh, one thing that does come up obviously you know we're talking about organizing we're talking about direct action that will um in many cases face legal repression right i know that that has been a thing that you all have dealt with in the uk um you know huda i think it'd be wonderful if you could share some of 
like what that has been like in the UK, as well as how um, Palestine Action has kind of uh, politicized that legal work as well and used it also as a kind of organizing strategy as well. While also acknowledging that this does mean people, you know, are going to spend jail time in some cases, are going to may end up doing prison time, etc. Um, but also maybe we should contextualize that as well within like the consequences that people in Gaza are facing for just existing, you know, and the the balance that we need to have there in terms of our own, um, you know, commitment to this struggle if we really want to be for Palestinian liberation. So, uh, yeah, anything you want to say about that? Uh, yeah, so I think over here it's been varied i mean we've had like i think at the start we saw like this intense attempt to intimidate um the ones of us who who kind of kicked it off and we were stopped under counter-terrorism not charged or anything like that with it but just you know interrogated for hours under this uh, they have this like loophole of a law where if you get stopped at a port or a border they can interrogate you for hours on end have access to all of your devices, et cetera. And if you don't, you, you don't have a right to no comment, you don't have a right to have uh, lawyers, et cetera, et cetera. You don't have any rights, basically. My, my lawyer was like, do you know your rights when you get stopped under this? And I said, yeah, I don't have any. She went, yeah, yeah, exactly. Um, but, you know, we had some of that at the start, but like, what I would say is when that started happening, it was very obvious to us that like we were doing exactly the right thing because I had never seen such intense repression. Um, that wasn't that intense, right? But I mean, I hadn't seen such a response to any other form of campaigning I had done. So I knew, okay, I'm onto something and this is what they're trying to do to stop us. Um, they, this also came after, like they had one month after we launched in uh, Britain, they had a meeting with um, between our foreign secretary at the time, Dominic Raab, and the Israeli ministry of strategic affairs and Israel's defense minister, Benny, Benny Gantz. And Israel basically said, these people who keep going into the London headquarters doing this stuff, you need to crush them, basically. And I read that because I was going through the Zionist press. And um, and like, to be honest, I was, I was over the moon because I was like, really? One month we've been doing this and this is what you guys are doing? Like, this is what... When, when you're no longer appealing to a middle person, you're no longer you're, you're no longer doing controlled dissent, so to speak, then they are so scared because they're like, well, if they don't care about getting arrested, if they are, okay, if they are willing to face prison, then how do we stop them, right? And I think that's the main thing is like, there is no, um, and to them, that is, that is scary when people take power back into their own hands and go, we know where you are and we're just gonna target you constantly. So, since then i think we've had different charges we have had some people go to prison for a few months it has been the minority uh we have seen um, heavy charges and i'm going on trial with uh, a few seven others from november the 13th but again like for us we do have defenses um they don't always let us have them but we do know that we're doing this to prevent the greater crime we're doing this to save lives and there's other things um, on a similar line, which actually means that technically it is actually not that we do it because it's legal, we do it because it's necessary, but that it, it is legal to stop these factories from operating in order to prevent the greater crime from happening or to prevent them from killing people. It's the same concept of, you know, if, if you see um, a house burning down and you smash a door down in order to save someone inside, no one is going to prosecute you for smashing that door down. And it's a very similar um, principle here. So we have seen people just a couple of weeks ago, someone caused um, over 500 grand's worth of damage to Arconic. They work with Elbit, but this was an action um, done on the second anniversary, on the fourth anniversary of the Grenfell fire, which is something that happened in London, where basically a tower block in London um, went ablaze. And it was basically down to these corporations who put this unsafe cladding, didn't give a crap about what they were pulling on this building, and over 72 people were killed. And that same company was also supplying parts for Israeli fighter jets. So this activist, along with others, shut down this factory, scaled onto the roof, and smashed it up. 
Um, and they were found not guilty by a jury in a relatively, you know, not liberal type area. Because obviously over here, the more serious your actions are, it means you have a higher chance of going to a Crown Court. And if you go to a Crown Court, you get a jury and then they get to decide if you're guilty or not guilty. So you're not just in the hands of one judge who decides um, who decides that. But for us, like, it's important uh, politically to, to maintain our innocence, maintain that we are not the criminals in this situation, that our systems are the criminals. And if we have to go down for that, then we will go down because in comparison to what is happening to the Palestinian people, it is it is nothing. It's absolutely nothing. And I think when and and obviously there is, you know, we're, we're all human here, right? No one really wants to get locked up for a few months a year, whatever it is. But I think when we see what current context the world is in, when we understand the history of how things have changed globally, and, and I think, you know, when you understand you're privileged just because you're based in the imperial court and you're not in, in the countries that your country is, in, is, 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 is fucking over, basically, then as international solidarity activists, we need to kind of up what we're willing to give for the ultimate struggle um, and for the Palestinian people. And so, you know, for me, I see what Palestinians are facing and I get strength from that. Um, and also, I think there's, it sounds strange, but I think it's almost liberating when you accept what the worst thing is that can happen. And then you're like, okay, I've accepted that. Now what? You know, it's like, actually, I will go shut them down. If that's the worst thing you can do to me, then fine. Um, we'll keep doing it. And the more and more people that do it, the harder it is to actually repress a movement like that. Um, and, and the closer you get to your goal. Yeah, absolutely. Fergie, I don't know if you wanted to add anything onto that. Well, I, I, I mean, I'm totally in step with that. Um, and it, 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 a lot of that influenced, again, why we decided to sort of move on making PAL Action US happen uh, when we did. Again, some of that was serendipitous. Some of that was just kind of being New England based, having a comrade who'd worked with the comrades in the UK, also knowing people who had mapped Elbit in Boston and the timing all sort of working that like, OK, uh, we did this. And is this Palestine Action US? OK, yes, this is Palestine Action US. Um, but but I, some of the reasons that we made the choice to move forward with that are, uh, I, I think, counter to a lot of the traditions that we have in direct action in the US. Uh, like, like in my experience, uh, a lot of the direct action, especially the the more volatile stuff, um, and 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 I mean this with the utmost respect. But like, I'm talking about like when we've seen boats blocked with Israeli arms out of ports on the West Coast, when we've seen uh, forest defenders in Atlanta, when we've seen uh, sort of uh, eco socialists or or eco anarchists um, working on on pipelines or in forests, like. We've seen incredibly impressive stuff, and usually it's done in a very clandestine way uh, and, in, and in very sort of scattered cells. Uh, look, I've always operated politically from a, from a platform of extreme visibility uh, because uh, there are a variety of reasons for that. I'm fairly visible to begin with. I have a lot of resources, um, uh, and I'm sort of part of a collective that, that is about moving resources around to different revolutionary groups and movements. Um, and at the end of the day, if we really want to build momentum uh, around a movement like this, uh, people have to know who's doing it. Um, uh, they have to know that there are numbers. They have to know that there is popular support uh, to some degree. And, and, and that makes us a lot safer. Um, not to mention that, yeah, there are resources. Um, I, I don't shy away from that. I like to be frank about this. Um, I came from uh, uh, an enormous uh, media and automotive capitalist firm in the US, uh, a, a family of bad people who do business with Israel, who do business with the Atlanta Police Foundation, uh, who do business with anybody that you can think of in the, you know, the sort of junket of, of the international uh, capitalist infrastructure. Um, and I made a decision in the last year to uh, liquidate all of my positions in my family's company. And we've uh, that's what the Babichki Collective is, is essentially a group of comrades now who are overseeing uh, how we strategically move that war chest, um, uh, as we call it. Um, and so we have resources um, uh, to fight this with. Um, 
We don't intend to get ourselves into unnecessary legal trouble for the for sake of making a big show about it. Um, it will never be about our legal stories, as Khoda correctly said. Um, there is absolutely no possible scenario that which we could encounter which would come even close to uh, what anybody in Gaza is, is facing right now um, and has faced every day since 1948. Um, anywhere in Palestine, uh, essentially. So, so this is um, uh, there is something humbling and motivating in that, um, and calming, I think. Um, uh, you know, and and understanding that we're on the right side of history. Like this is what the concept of revolutionary suicide is about, right? Like uh, it's it's not literal suicide. We don't wish to harm ourselves. We don't wish that harm to come to our comrades. Um, but we do uh, we do wish to detach ourselves. Uh, from from the comforts that we're accustomed to in day to day life, if 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 we mean that we want to see a different world uh, for every generation which will come after us, um, and and it does apply to everybody in in the imperial core in the U.S. in the U.K. just about everybody um, uh, that's that's having these kinds of conversations that's involved in organizing movements. Um, again, I'm in a unique situation where you know if we want to talk about privilege, like. And people like me uh, really need to shut up and put their ass on the line. There's no doubt. Um, uh, but but this applies to, you know, if you're a college student at uh, at an Ivy League school, at a liberal arts institution, um, uh, if you have a graphic design job in a major city in the East Coast of the U.S., uh, uh, you you are comfy. And, uh, and and if and if you have emotions and 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 feelings and ideas about what's happening in the world and what's happening in Palestine, uh, yeah, it really behooves you to to do something more serious about it. Um, and 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 not come up with a thousand excuses why this week I can't really afford to put myself in that position. Yeah, you can. We all can. Um, uh, and 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 uh, we have each other's back. We have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of eyes on us now. Um, we have the support of an international movement. Um, uh, and, and we have the support of a lot of, a lot of organizations and comrades in this country and in other countries. Uh, so we're not going at this alone. Um, and, and, and we should take a lot of strength in that. Right on, thank you. Um, so I wanna get to a couple of questions people had in the chat, just like kind of clarifications. I know that we can answer these. Um, one is sort of this discussion of, uh, you know, this question of one, just, I mean, I think we touched on this earlier, but just reiterating folks had questions about like how many factories or, or sites, right, have been closed by the work in the UK and um, how come they would not reopen? There was a later discussion about, you know, Yes, we know they have to bring in new security, but why don't they just bring in the new security and reopen? And so, Huda, I know you can speak a little bit to like some of the examples of that and why that those factories have ultimately closed. And that would be, I think, useful for folks. Yeah, so I'll start with Oldham. So the Oldham campaign, I mean, there have been, um, so for those who don't know, Oldham is in the north of England. That's actually where I, I, I lived for a very long time. And so there had been like a local campaign, people campaigning, you know, protests, petitions, that kind of thing. And Palestine actually launched in the summer of July 2020. And we just kept going after most of the factories, including the Oldham one. Um, but what you would see is, so people would get on the roof, cause loads of damage. Uh, the factories have to shut down for a week, two weeks at a time. So their, their profits are being severely disrupted on a constant basis. And then every time they would up the security a little bit more, so they'd start getting some barbed wire or whatever around the, around the things, or they'd get another security guard. And then you would find another way to get onto the roof and do the same action again and again. And so then at one point, they had like six, I think six or six or eight security guards, something like that. You know, they had a guy patrolling on the roof and people just kept coming at them from different angles, finding different ways to get onto the roof. And I think at that point, and people had broken inside that factory as well, two, um, two local Kashmiris actually uh, went inside that factory and caused a lot of damage to the machinery and weaponry inside that building. Um, that was one of, the, uh, one of the final actions. And I think as well, because it was a massive security breach, that shut them down for quite, um, for quite a long time. And... You know, the interesting thing about Oldham and some of these other sites is that, 
you know, they would put them in areas where there was a strong Asian community, uh, strong, and, you know, Asian here is like um, Muslim, Muslim, Pakistani, Indian, Kashmiri population who, who detested the fact this factory was there and did a lot to work against it. Um, and so that just kept happening on a repeated basis to the, to the point where they didn't know if the next day they were going to be able to get, go to work or not. They were not able to secure that site. And at the same time, they were probably having to call the Ministry of Defence constantly explaining how they have once again compromised security. And it got to a point where Albert just announced we're no longer going to have this site basically and, and shut it down um, shut it down completely. So I think it gets to a point where it's just, it's not physically, it's not materially possible for them to continue their, their, their business in these sites. And I think that's exactly the power of direct action in between constantly sabotaging their business, constantly shutting them down to the point where they cannot fulfill their contracts on time, they're no longer reliable, to then also them having to increase the costs of security constantly and then that failing i think all of those different factors together it affects their bottom line and if their bottom line isn't working then there's there's no point of them continuing that business and so they shut that side down they didn't relocate they just um they just uh, shut down that uh, factory which was which was incredible and then the london hq so we've been targeting that site for probably two years before it shut down but what I think was the nail in the coffin, so to speak, was a targeted eight, six to eight week campaign uh, before it fully closed down, where people uh, twice a week would lock on. So it's just like using some sort of devices, but it's not a device, it's just a block of cement mostly, right? And you would lock yourself onto these things in front of the front door so they couldn't open up their offices. Um, and conveniently, they only had one main door in and out of the building, makes it a lot easier to shut down. So they would do that twice a week, throw red paint all over the site, et cetera. And then at the same time, people would target the landlords of that headquarters constantly. Um, and it was, it was after that in the summer of last year that it was announced that they had uh, left and had basically abandoned their London headquarters. So I think it's just the actual uh, physical act of blockading and shutting them down, affecting their bottom line, um, and also finding their vulnerabilities. Whereas their, do, their, do their landlords really want to have to pull up with you? Do the other businesses in that office block want to have to put up with also being shut down? And, and obviously, if, you know, for us, ethically, if we shut down that business, stop them from being able to make weapons to kill people, then the other people in that building just going to have to put off with it until that until Albert Systems is gone out of that building. Um, and so we still have eight sites left in this country to shut down, and we look forward to doing that as soon as possible. Right on. Um, so there was another question I did want to bring up. Some folks had asked, um, you know, and I and I. I know the answer to it, but I'll let you speak to it, like sort of why you, you touched on it in the beginning, but just remind folks why Elbit is the focus. And um, also um, there was a question if you have other campaigns or other corporations. So I know that Elbit is the main focus, but maybe you could just reiterate to folks quickly, like why that is. So I'll speak to that from the US. Um, uh, I think Hada would have maybe a slightly different answer for the UK. Um, because for the U.S., the answer hopefully is both. Um, I think it, 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 as we said earlier, to to target one firm specifically uh, actually helps us build momentum. Uh, really does material damage uh, to that business. As Huda just, I mean, really what uh, you just described in uh, from from step to step over two years of shutting down the London HQ and, and the other facility that if you just go to different places, especially different businesses all over the country, none of nothing like that would ever happen. Um, so it, it, it's uh, to be focused enough to show people that this kind of direct action can really yield results. Um, now, look, I, we we're in the US, it's a much bigger place than the UK. Um, and it is the sort of you know, historical center of, you know, the largest white supremacist murder for profit pyramid scheme in the history of the world. Uh, right. Like this is what this 
unfortunately, this continent is right now. So there are weapons companies everywhere. Um, and there are millions of people who are, uh, especially in this generation, sort of waking up to the realities of, you know, the, the dynamics of imperialism. Um, so, I, look, I, I'm very hopeful that that we can mount a, a successful campaign to start shutting down Elbit centers uh, in, in all of the different states where they're located as the months go on, and that uh, we can leverage the, our visibility, our, our success, um, and, uh, you know, and what we're doing into really growing out our base to millions of people. Uh, and, and if at that point, I think it would be viable to start to target other firms as well, um, both other weapons firms that are involved in the occupation um, and, and even uh, other kinds of companies that are complicit uh, to, to some degree or another. You know, I don't know. I'm, I'm, I'm sort of, this is conjecture. Um, but I think we'd love to see it grow to that. You know, we have comrades right here in the area that are doing similar things. Um, uh, some of the folks from, the, from uh, the group I've been involved with in the Berkshires uh, just did a stakeout at General Dynamics, some of their comrades in Western Mass uh, with um, uh, demilitarized Western Mass uh, hit an L3 site in uh, in the Pioneer Valley the same day that we hit Cambridge um, and have had a pretty sustained uh, campaign of actions against them. Um, so I think we hope that both, we hope both that people who are engaged in those efforts um, might collaborate with us uh, to, to, you know, to, to really up the ante and the pressure on Elbit um, for the reasons that we've identified <clears throat> and then leverage that momentum to, to make this uh, a much broader thing. And in the end, uh, you know, if, if that can eventually yield uh, a, another really strong column in the anti-imperialist movement uh, sort of across the board in this country, well, great. Um, we just don't want to get like really oversaturated and again, make it about aesthetics and performance. We want results. Yeah, I think that that was that was like, yeah, perfect. Because that's the thing, isn't it? It's about winning at the end of the day. And when you put these resources and energy into one single target, then you can really hit them hard rather than spending yourself too thin. And also a little bit like is it in terms of being Palestine action, like it is literally Israel's largest weapons firm. And I think we talked at the start about what Elbit does, but this is a company that not only supply the majority of the Israeli weapons, but they also work directly with the Israeli military to conduct the attacks. So they're basically working hand in hand with the soldiers in order to, uh, you know, drop these missiles, fly these drones, et cetera, et cetera. So this is literally a company who is embedded in the apparatus of the Israeli military. And so if you want to hit the Israeli military, then globally, then you want to hit Elbert systems. And that way we can make the most tangible impact. And just going back to the start where, you know, we're talking about how much of this weaponry is exported to other places across the world and how central Palestine is in that dynamic from the US border wall between uh, you know, the US and Mexico. We've got similar stuff here. It's Elbert drones being used to surveil migrants seeking refuge in this country. So much of the weaponry that we see and the facial recognition, um, you know, the surveillance, it starts off in Palestine and it's exported across the world. And so when you realize that, you realize that Elbert is in the middle of that, then it makes them, you know, a very viable target for when you want to a campaign against imperialism and for the liberation of the Palestinian people. Yeah, right on. Um, a couple of things like so one, I have the banner down there. I do want to make sure folks do register for this webinar. I'm sure that you all will give a lot more um, specific information about the U.S. launch there and be able to probably um, answer some questions or provide information that will answer the questions that people may have. Um, and also give folks some guidance on, you know, how to tap into this. One thing we didn't talk about, well, let's do a quick question. So one question was uh, from Mackenzie, just are there active legal funds to support the work of Palestine Action US? Um, I, yeah, that's kind of a yes or no, but. No, at the moment, I will subsidize the whole damn thing. And I don't care who knows that. <laughs> right on. Um, the other thing that I did want to mention was, um, Huda, I remember when we talked last year, you talked a little bit about how Palestine action has been organized, um, you know, in order to also help the organization in some ways, whether some of the repression 
meaning in terms of action is often, as I understand it, taken autonomously by uh, groups who want to take the action. Um, it may be worth saying something along those lines uh, here, if, if, if possible. Yeah, what I'd say is we try and give um, the tools and the targets and the information so that people can make those decisions about what type of actions they want to do and to be able to hit Elbit constantly. I'd also say that recently um, a list of targets across the country who are places affiliated with Elbit um, in, the, in, in this country landlords, suppliers, etc., has been released so people can actually find local targets there's a guide that goes with that so they can see the kind of tactics that they can do completely autonomously um, you know ideally get away obviously there's always a risk with this kind of stuff but we're you know trying to provide the tools to make it easy for people to just take this action um, on their own as much as possible especially considering the amount of people who are looking at what's happening in Palestine and you know thinking what what can I do about it this is what you can do um, but people can join us. We do have workshops like every other day. I think at the moment, um, if you're if you're based in Britain, we run through what type of actions you can do. We run through the uh, legal consequences and all the stuff you need to know about it. And then you can be uh, placed in groups where you then decide what action you're going to do and and go for it and shut them down. Yeah, and I, I just yeah. wanted to say from the US perspective on that too, um, and, you know, we're slowly sort of upping our capacity to be able to conduct, the, you know, workshops uh, as often um, as thoroughly. Uh, but like we're so lucky that uh, that everything has happened in the UK for as long as it has, because I mean, there's a, there's a, a, a wealth of information there. I think between that um, and then some of the comrades, uh, whether it's, a, you know, a little bit of my own experience and then, you know, other folks I've worked with you know, involved in direct actions in the U.S., kind of like navigating U.S. law and all that. We, we're, we're lucky to have a good core of people who are either directly involved or at least advising us um, so that we can be uh, really smart uh, about everything we do, not just smart in terms of like keeping ourselves safe, but like smart in terms of how effective we are. Uh, and sometimes keeping ourselves safe, mitigating uh, the the financial damages and, and emotional damages and energy that goes into legal fights. Yeah, that's part of it. Um, but uh, but but we're going to be developing that. I think you know it it it, it should be stated that you know again I, I'm I'm totally willing as as all of us who are kind of in the in in the forefront of organizing this thing to to say that we are doing that and you know we are who we are. I, I mean I just said I'll you know pay for these legal fees and all that. Uh, we we will be careful. Um, not just to save our own asses, but but just procedurally speaking, for the sake of having an effective movement, that uh, the, the nature of coordination is autonomous enough, uh, you know, that nobody's really committing some major, right? Like uh, people will have the opportunity uh, at the end of the day when direct action is taken, people will be making choices and using their own agency to do that. Um, it will not be because uh, myself or Kala or someone in the UK or whatever said you need to do this and, and and this is what we've planned and go out and carry it out shit if someone in talladega alabama wants to go stake out in front of that elbit operation center today and and you know and just do a rally and bring some attention to it by all means please do uh you know i, I if folks don't understand the the, the nature of higher leverage uh, direct action and the legal consequences um you know i, I i'm i'm not going to say go go put yourself in situations you're not familiar with yet but if you want to make some noise, make some noise and, you know, do whatever. So uh, I think it'll be a healthy balance of good communication, uh, good sharing of best practices, um, uh, providing people with resources wherever they need them. Um, but making sure that, uh, you know, people are legally protected, you know, by their own autonomy and, and empowered, uh, you know, to take action themselves. Yeah, much appreciated. Um, so do you all have anything else that you wanted to make sure to get across to the listeners and the viewers while we have you here today? Um, I really appreciate both of you taking the time, um, making the time getting here this morning um, or this afternoon for you, Huda, um, and, uh, you know, having this conversation with us. Again, I do urge people to check out uh, our prior uh, audio podcast episode with Huda 
which gives a lot more of your own personal story as well as um, the story of kind of the development of Palestine action in the UK. Um, I definitely, you know, encourage people, please, to to sign up for that, re register for this webinar, check it out. Um, yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know if there's anything else you all wanted to add. Uh, just quickly, just that there's a launch event. I'm sure you've, you've already mentioned it, that that's tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern time and um, 10 p.m. London time. But obviously, we won't mainly want people in the U.S. on that. Obviously, anyone's welcome to come. But I just add as well that Elbit, um, there was a recent action by another group in Australia against an Elbit site in Australia, which was pretty, pretty great to see. Uh, so this company is global. So wherever you are, because I know lots of people from different places watch this, just Google your country and Elbit and see if you have an Elbit site in your country, because you know the chances are you probably do. Um, they're in Australia, Austria, Belgium, Brazil, Canada, France, Georgia, Germany, Hungary, India, Israel, of course, uh, Mexico, Romania, Sweden, Switzerland, UK, USA, and the UAE. So if you're in any of those places, you know what to do. Right on. Thank you. Thank you both for this. Um, you know, just want to encourage the audience to, to absolutely register for that um, launch event. Um, tomorrow, 5 p.m. Eastern time. Uh, that's October 24th, if you're listening to this, you know, later. Um, and uh, yeah, just follow the social media accounts, pay, you know, plug in, plug into this movement. And, you know, also, of course, selfishly, we also want to encourage people to support um, our platform so that we can bring you conversations like this. We're doing multiple live streams a day sometimes, and certainly um, we did three last week, and we'll be doing at least four or five this week um, at 12 p.m. So in about an hour, we will have Eve Six, the alt rockers, talking about why they support a free Palestine and talking a little bit about their own politicization. Um, last week, we had Decolonize Palestine, a couple of comrades from Ramallah, West Bank, um, really laying out a lot of the history, debunking Zionist myths. Um, and then, of course, we had the conversation we mentioned earlier that Fergie mentioned with Max Isle, um, which is a really good discussion as well. And so anyways, just encourage people to support um, our work and then to get involved in these struggles and to, you know, put themselves on the line if they're if they're brave enough to do so. Um, and we appreciate both of you for your courage and for joining us here today to, you know, spend time with us and respond to questions from us and our audience. Thanks so much. Um, yeah, you know, you. The only last thing I would just say is that as, as we approach what's going on in Palestine, where there are lots and lots of conversations about where, where should we be positioned on a ceasefire? Uh, what is, should the nature of anti-colonial resistance be? Uh, what should the, you know, all these kind of things about what should happen over there. And I just want to remind folks that our position as revolutionaries and uh, people in solidarity with the Palestinian struggle here in the Imperial Corps is one of exclusive partisanship uh, to that anti-colonial resistance. We don't really need to have opinions on those other things. We need to act in the interest of the resistance, period. That's yeah. why we're no. Absolutely. Totally agree. And um, appreciate you both. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Thanks so much.